The title of this teaching is going to be Some Religious Leaders Are Wolves. I've spoke about wolves before, but I'm going to use scriptures tonight, and Jesus is going to show us the wolves. We're going to, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 21. This is when Jesus is coming into Jerusalem, riding on the donkey, and the people, all the people were praising him. And in verse 29 it says, And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Now in Hebrew the word Hosanna means save now or save we beseech thee. That's what Hosanna means. So pretty much they were crying Savior to the son of David. Saying son of David to him was another way of them recognizing him as being from the bloodline of King David. So that meant that was something big to say when they said son of David. This shows us that Joseph, Jesus' earthly father, was already dead now. Because if he wasn't, then he would have been next to be king. Because you don't, you don't skip over the father and go to the son. This, I'm just showing that Joseph, his father, is dead at this time. Because they're, they're saying to Jesus, recognizing him as he's to be king. In verse 10, and when he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And in verse 9, they're on the outskirts of town. But now they're in the city, asking, Who is this man? So the people in the city that weren't out there were saying, Who is this man? And they were crying, Savior, Son of David. But now they're in the city, and the religious leaders are, are around. Now the people, they... Uh, they feared the religious leaders. It's not that they uh, feared them for physical danger, but there was, they were religious leaders and people looked up to them. And now that Jesus is in town and the religious, are, religious leaders are around, you're going to see a change in the people. Out, out there they were praising him and saying, Savior, Son of David. Now they're in the city. In verse 11, and the multitude said, This is Jesus, Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth, of Galilee. This is Jesus, the prophet. Prophet, they had many prophets. Prophets were just men. So they went from son of Savior, son of David. Now they're saying, This is Jesus, the prophet. You understand what I'm saying? Out there, they were praising him as king. But now they were just saying, This is a prophet, just, just a man. They also called him the son of David. Not a, not a son of David. They said the son of David. But now they're saying a. Do you see what I'm trying to get at? Out there, the Savior, son of David, recognize him pretty much as the Savior. Now they're in the city around religious leaders. Now they're saying he's a, he's a son of David. I don't know if y'all caught that. So they're pretty much just saying he's another prophet. Which at that time, like I said, they had many prophets. And then in verse 12, And Jesus went into the temple of God, and cast all them that sold and bought in the temple, and overthrew the tables of the money changers, and the seats of them that sold doves, and said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Jesus says, This is my house. And he starts to clean it up. It's really his father's house. But Jesus says, this is my house. So what's he saying there? He's God. It's just another way of him, of him saying he's God. Because it's his house. Jesus says, it's my house. But the temple was known as the house of God. So right here, they should have, that should have told him something. Mm -hmm. For these people to start selling things in the temple, they had to get permission from the religious leaders that was their temple. So they had to have permission to sell things in there. And of course, these religious leaders, which we're going to find aren't really men of God, but because of that, they gave the okay for these people to, to sell things in the temple. And of course, I'm sure part of it had to go to them, so that's why they let them. You know, you're selling stuff in our, right. in our temple, so, you know, 
give me 10 percent of whatever you sell whatever you know th i'm sure this is what happened just like today statues you know who gets money off the statues who sells the statues just thought i'd throw that out there it's the same thing today so you better believe their hands in it this made the the leaders pretty upset of course when jesus went in there and turned over all the tables because what he was doing he was taking money out of their pocket it wasn't because he he was uh doing anything to their religion but he was still not stealing he was taking money out of their pocket and this is why the religious leaders got mad okay verse 14 and the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them and when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful thing that he did and the children crying in the temple and saying hosanna to the son of david they were sore displeased now they're saying son of david hosanna to thee to the son of david now they're back to saying thee again why because they seen they seen jesus and the things he was doing not only did they get upset because of the money they started to get upset because people started to, to go to him recognizing him as the son of david they were bringing the sick to, to him instead of them which they probably wouldn't have brought the sick to them anyway because I have there is no place in the Bible where it showed that the religious leaders healed anyone. Right. So you look at it this way. You're a religious leader. You're the head. Now this man comes along and everybody's going to him. Okay, first Jesus takes money out of their pocket. Now this man, Jesus, is taking all the attention away from them to him. So we can see why these religious leaders are getting very upset with them. This happens today when someone is preaching or teaching something different from whatever doctrine they have and the people are coming to him right away, they want to know who is this. I can kind of fit in that boat because I go to a Baptist church but I don't teach Baptist doctrine. And I'm sure the Baptist on some of my teachings may say, who is this? Who? What's he teaching? That's not the way we believe. And then Jesus was showing them by healing the people that his authority came from God. This shows right here that signs don't save. Because if they did, these men should have fell to their knees as soon as they seen that Jesus was healing. They should have fell to his knees. They, they heard the crowd say, Son of the Son of David. They heard, they heard the crowd call him Savior. And then they saw him heal. The religious, the religious leaders should have fell on their knees right then and there and recognized him as the Messiah. But instead, less than a week later, less than a week later, they put him to death. Religious leaders put him to death. The Bible says that the people are drawn by the Father, not by signs. You can have all these signs, but the Bible plainly says when you come to the Lord, it's because he draws you. Signs don't save people, because if signs save people, these religious leaders would have gotten saved then. And plus, he, the Bible says, only a wicked and perverse generation seeks after a sign. That's what the Bible says. So signs are not for saving people. We have people that today who's, who say, show me a sign, and they will believe. It's a lie. That's what they're saying, but it's a lie. They're not going to believe. Even if, even if they saw a sign, they still wouldn't believe. They still have whatever excuse they have to say, well, uh, I don't know. I'm not sure. Jesus didn't need their authority to preach or to heal. He didn't have to go to them and ask if he could preach or to heal. He did everything by the will of the Father. And that's, what, that's the way we should be. We do things by the will of the Father. Men of God are here to please the Lord, not man. And this is why I have this Bible study here at my house. Because no one can tell me what to teach or preach. My pastor wanted me to, this was a good while back, he wanted me to teach in the church. But I told him, I said, no, because if I teach in the church, then people are going to think I'm teaching Baptist doctrine. And I'm not. I'm just teaching the scriptures. So my authority is from the Holy Spirit, from the Father. That's who tells me what to preach. And that's all I need. I'm here to please Him, and I'm not here to please man. Verse 16 and said unto him, Hearest thou what these say? So the religious leaders are saying, Do you hear what they're saying? And Jesus said unto them, Yea. 
Have ye never read, Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast perfect praise? Like I said, the religious leader said, Are you hearing what they're saying? Savior, son of David? Now, because they saw the power he had, they're calling him Savior again, like I said. And Jesus says, Yes, I hear them. And Jesus says unto them, Haven't you read the scriptures? Haven't you read? Meaning the Old Testament. That's what he was saying. Haven't you read? Well, he's talking about the Old Testament. These religious leaders had head knowledge. They had head knowledge of the scriptures. Like I said before, the, these religious leaders, they had to memorize the first five books of the Bible. They had to memorize the Psalms. And they had to memorize most of the major uh, prophets. That's a lot of memorizing. But that's what they had to do to become a religious leader. So they had the head knowledge, but they didn't have the word in their heart, which we're going to see that over and over. They didn't have the word in their heart. Many are that way today. They know the word of God, but they don't live it. Many Christians know the word of God, but they don't live it. They live it at the church when they're around Christians, but when they get out in the world, guess what? They act just like the world. They know the word but they don't live it. When we take the Word of God to heart, we will be like it says in Matthew 6. When we take the Word of God to heart, we will be hungry and thirsty for His words so we can be, so we can be right with Him. That's when we take it at heart. When you have it up here in, in your mind, head knowledge, you're not looking to please the Lord. But when you have Jesus in your heart, in your heart, now you're looking to please God. And the way to please God is by reading the words. Every time these leaders would ask Jesus a question, He would tell them, the Scripture says. Every time you, you, you read the New Testament and, and they would ask Jesus a question, He would always come back, the Scripture says. And that's the way we need to be. If someone comes to us and asks us a question about salvation, Jesus, anything biblically, we need to take them to the Scriptures. Don't take them and don't don't answer them by saying what well, my pastor says or my teacher says. That's just a man. But if you go to them and say what well, the Bible says and you show them what the Bible says, now you've got some authority. Mm -hmm. Now you got some power behind what you're saying. If you get your feelings hurt easily, stay away from the word of God. Stay away from the word of God because God's word, his words will offend us because we don't know how to live. He's having to show us. That's When you're born again, that means God has to show you how to live. So if you get your feelings hurt easily, you're going to be getting your, your feelings hurt a lot when you read the Bible. If you're taking it to heart. Now, you can stay under your pastor or your teacher because they're not going to offend you. Most of them. They're not going to offend the people when they're preaching. Because if they offend the people when they're preaching, what's that do to the love offering? It comes down. And, and sorry to say, but a lot of preachers are in it for the money. We don't have that many real men of God out there under pulpits. We really don't. Praise God that we do. We need to, we need to give them the scriptures. We need, we need to say, hey, the heck with what man says. What does the scripture say? Okay? Give them the word of God. Amen. And if you don't know the word of God, whose fault is that? yourselves for not reading for not studying now even though you're coming and you're listening to a pastor or you're listening to a teacher that's great and that's good and you grow that's fine but make sure you remember the scriptures that are given to you so you can say the scripture says instead of saying my pastor said hope you all understand that mm -hmm. jesus told him even babies know to give him praise even the babies know to give him praise that that should have put them to shame but it didn't. This is saying that you don't have to be very intelligent to know who Jesus is. Because if babies know who He is, then we don't have to be very smart. Because babies are not very smart when they're first, you know, when they're young, okay? Most of the time, the intelligent people who are intelligent, they miss Jesus. They're so smart, they miss who Jesus is. The hardest people to reach are religious people, and people who go to college because they all they they think they know it all. 
Then in verses 18 and 19, right after he speaks to the religious, religious leaders, Jesus gave an illustration to show how the religious leaders are. In verse 18, Now in the morning, as he returned into the city, he hungered. And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon, but leaves only, and said to it, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforth forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. What Jesus was shown was the fig tree that had leaves should also have fruit. If it has leaves, it should have fruit also. He was shown that even though these religious leaders looked religious on the outside, but on the inside they had no fruit. This is a parable. He's, he's talking to the religious leaders. This whole, this whole chapter here, he's talking to religious leaders. And he gives this illustration of a fig tree. He said that fig tree has leaves, but it has no fruit. He's addressing the religious leaders. So what he's telling them is, is you're religious on the outside, but you have no fruits coming from the inside. You're just for show is pretty much what he was saying. You're, you're just for show. These religious leaders showed that they were spiritually dead. They were spiritually dead. And because of that, he cursed them and they withered away. He cursed the tree, but he will be cursing those who don't believe. These religious leaders, like I said, had head knowledge. And they believed just like the devil believes. They believe, the devil believes, but he doesn't give his heart to the Lord. Same thing with, with these religious leaders. They believe, but they haven't given their heart to the Lord. In Matthew 7, verse 19, Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewed down and cast into the fire. That's a, that's a, this is another verse showing what he was saying in this verse I just read. Also in Matthew 3, verses 7 and 8, But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generations of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance. John called them vipers. It was because they were wicked, poisonous attacks on Jesus. That's why he called them vipers. They were always attacking Jesus. And also, he called them vipers because they were, they were leading the people astray. The religious leaders did not lead the people to the Savior, to the Lord, which is Jesus. We have many preachers who are doing the same thing today, and they're called wolves. These preachers and these teachers, they teach and they preach positive thinking. That's not, that's not taking you to the Lord. Mind over matter, all that stuff. You got many preachers who preach that way. And this is what these religious leaders were doing. And John, John the Baptist called them vipers. For the Christians, for the Christians, it's just the opposite. The fruits of life. Romans 6.22 But now being made free from sin, which he's talking to Christians here, and become servants to God, ye have your fruits unto holiness, and the end everlasting life. Where these up here, they have, they have no fruits of holiness. And what's it say? They're going to wither away. But the Lord tells us, we have everlasting life. Amen? Amen. Now let's drop down to verse 23. And when he was coming to the temple, the chief priests and elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, By what authority doest thou these things? And who gave thee this authority? Now Jesus has returned to the city and he goes into the temple and he starts preaching again. And the head religious leaders and many other people were there. They asked Jesus, By what authority do you do these things? These religious leaders, we're going to see they're a little slow. They're a little slow. We already see that they're a little slow because like it says, uh, babes could recognize Jesus where they couldn't. In verse 14, they saw him do miracles by healing the sick. Did that touch him? No. In verse 15, the people call him Savior, son of David. Did that touch him? No. These people are bright enough to see who he is. But the religious leaders are blind. Sounds like some of the religions today. We have religions today. This teaching is called what? Religious leaders are wolves. Some religious leaders are wolves. These are religious leaders. And if 
while you're listening to this teaching, if this reminds you of your religion, do you want to stay there? We should get out. When you go to a church and your religious leader, pastor, is preaching everything but Jesus, there's only one thing to preach or teach, and that's Jesus. That's it. He's given us His words, and that's what preachers and teachers do. They teach us about the Lord. You got teachers and preachers out there, they might give you one verse, and they talk for 45 minutes and give you stories. Jesus is going to answer them this question in the same way that Nathan the prophet gave to King David, the parable about the two men. Remember King David? Nathan came to him, and he, he said hey, there was a rich man, he had many animals, and they had a poor man, all he had was a lamb. And the rich man had company guests come over to the house, and instead of killing one of his animals, which he had many, he killed this one lamb from this poor, this poor man had one lamb and he took his lamb and fed his guests. And so Nathan says to David, you know, what should happen to this man, this rich man? And David said, the rich man should be put to death. Nathan showed him how David was that rich man. And the way, the way it was done there is the Lord is doing the same thing here with these verses. He's letting, the, he's letting these religious leaders He's just, he's, their questions and the way he answers in parables, that's the way he's going to answer their questions in parables. And when they see it, they're going to see that he's talking about them. But they're, they're going to answer it in a way that they don't know he, that he's talking about them until later. Just like with David. The Lord takes a question that anyone asks and he replies it to the person or person who ever asks it. He replies in a way that they're going to judge themselves. Right. Jesus is a smart man. Really? <laughs> I mean, he's, he trapped them many times. I mean, I have a teaching on that, but he trapped them many times. The more dumb questions they would ask, the, the more they would realize, we're really dumb here. Now in verse 24, And Jesus answered and said unto them, I also will ask you one thing, which if you tell me in... <clears throat> I, and likewise, will tell you by what authority I do these things. And he says, The baptism of John, whence was it? From heaven or of man? And they reasoned with themselves, saying, If we shall say from heaven, he will say unto us, Why did ye not then believe him? Again, Jesus has a way of trapping them. Verse 26, But if we shall, if we shall say of men, we fear the people for all Hold John a prophet. If they confess that he was a man, they're saying they didn't believe John the Baptist. Which back when John was baptizing, he was baptizing for the remission of sin. In Mark 1, it, it says that. They had already showed that they didn't believe by refusing to get baptized, believing they didn't have sin. These were the, these were the religious leaders. They thought, they thought they were up here. Okay, they were above everybody else. They didn't have to be baptized for the religion for the remission of sin. It says in Luke chapter seven verse thirty, but the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of Him. They refused to get baptized. Like I said, they didn't think they had sin. They were religious. Have you ever noticed that the higher that religious men, the higher they get in their religion, the further they get from the Word of God. I've noticed that. I've seen it. And this is what's happening here. Even to the fact that them, that themselves, believe they're without sin. And they start to accept worship from the people. You have religious men who get so high, who the higher they get, they, they, they just think they're without sin and they start accepting worship from people. This happens, it's, ha it's happening today. They feared the people for two reasons. They were afraid of being attacked by them. They were afraid that the people and wouldn't follow them anymore. So they didn't know how to answer Jesus. In verse 27, and, and they answered Jesus and said, We cannot tell. And he said unto them, Neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. These religious leaders were liars. 
and they were dishonest because they knew they did know so Jesus told told them since you didn't believe John you're not going to believe me either so I'm not going to tell you anything if you couldn't believe what John the Baptist was saying because he was sent by the Lord to prepare the way for Jesus he was sent by God so he's saying this if you didn't believe him then you're not going to believe me either so I'm not going to tell you both of our authorities came from God but they're not going to believe it and they didn't Jesus gives them a parable. It doesn't say it, it's a parable right here, but we learn, when we learn how to read the Bible, you'll see it. This is a parable he's getting ready to give. But in verse 33 it says, when we get down to verse 33, it says, hear another parable. So this, what we're reading right now before verse 33, must be a parable, because in verse 33 he says, hear another parable. And also in verse 45 it says, when they heard his parables. So there's going to be two parables here. Even though he's not saying this is a parable. But from reading verse 33 and verse 45. We know we're getting ready to hear a parable. So in verse 28. But what think ye? A certain man had two sons. And he came to the first and said. Son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said. I will not. But afterwards he repented and went. And he came to the second and said likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir, and went not. Whether of the two did the will of the Father? And they said unto him, the religious leader said to Jesus, the first. Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. This is what Jesus told the religious leaders. Again, Jesus is having them judge them their own selves. They said the first, which is true, the first one. He said no, but then he repented and he went. He did go. He told, he said no first, but then he repented, saw he was wrong, and then he went. But they're just like the second one. The second one said he would go, but never did. He had no intentions of going. He just lied to the Father. He was disobedient. That's what they were like. And when Jesus said the tax collectors and the whores would get to heaven before them, they got pretty infuri infuriated with that. Because they, were, because they, the tax collectors and the whores, of course, they were considered the scum of the society. And Jesus said, this scum of society that y'all think they are, they're going to make it to heaven before you. Does Jesus tell it like it is? Yep. Did, he, did he sugarcoat this in any way? No. So should we expect our pastor to sugarcoat things so we don't get offended? No. We need to hear like it is. We need to. And Jesus is telling them exactly like it is. Jesus was telling them that the tax collectors and harlots who choose to disobey the Lord but later would repent and get to heaven. It's just like the first one. The first son he was talking to. He said no, but then they repented and did what, what the father told them to. Did y'all see that? I know that sometimes I say things and it sounds like, Jesse, that's pretty hard. I ought, I ought to be a little nicer when I teach. Well, no. it's right there. who's my teacher? Really? We're, who's teaching me? The Lord, the Word of God. When He puts it that way, then I'm going to put it that way. Right. He didn't say, Jesse, uh, be sweet, be kind, don't hurt their feelings. Mm -mm. Jesus is my teacher, and that's who I learn from. So when I say things that are pretty blunt, it's because Jesus did the same thing. And we see it right here. Verse 32, And John came unto him in the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not. He's talking to the religious leaders, and you didn't believe him. But the publicans and the harlots believed him. And ye, when ye had seen it, repented not afterwards that ye might believe him. He tells them that John showed them the right way and they didn't accept it. Then he tells them that the tax collectors, who the people didn't like, people didn't like tax collectors. They were wicked. They would try to get every penny they could from you. So the people didn't like them. 
But these tax collectors saw the truth. Just like the whores, the prostitute. These are considered to be low-grade people. But they saw the truth. When they saw the truth, they repented and confessed to God. Which, that's in another verse. You know, the Mark, Matthew, Luke, Mark, Matthews, Mark, Luke, and John, they all say the same thing, but different books have a little more than what the other one says. So there's another book that says they confessed. These tax collectors and these whores confessed their sins. And that's why they're going to make it to heaven. The tax collectors and prostitutes, they can believe, but the religious leaders couldn't. We're reading the, the words of God, right? Right. I have to praise God that I have a preacher who is a man of God. Mm -hmm. You know, not too many people can say that. But I can say it. My pastor is a man of God. He preaches the word in the spirit. And I thank the Lord for him. They saw these people open their eyes and repent. But they were too good to do so. They were too good to do so. He tells them that they're going to make it to heaven before they do. Now don't get confused here. He's not saying that these wicked, money-hungry tax collectors and these whores are going to go to heaven. They're just going to go to heaven. No. Like I said, they had to repent. They had to confess and became believers to make it to heaven. If they would have done the same thing as the religious leaders and not confessed their sins, they wouldn't be going to heaven either. But like, I, like it shows here, they did. They did see the light and came to it. Even people who think they're morally good but don't have the Lord in their heart are the same boat as his religious leaders. Listen to me. I'm going to give you the scriptures to read. People who are morally good, good people, will take the shirt off their back for you. But they're morally good. Let's see what the Bible says about that. Isaiah 6-4-6 But we... Are all, but we are all as unclean things. We, that's everybody. That's everybody, every human being. But we are all as unclean things. And all our righteousness, all of our goodness, are as filthy rags to the Lord. So it doesn't matter how good you are. Unless you have the goodness of God in you. And the only way you're going to have that is by accepting, accepting Him in your heart. That's the only way you're going to get it. Unless you do that, the Lord says, Your goodness is as filthy rags to me. That's what He's saying right there. We are all sinners, and because of that, we, our sin is defiling, which means we're unclean. It is destructive. It destroys. It tears down. It doesn't, it's not helpful at all. That's why our goodness cannot compare to the goodness of God. We're not even in the same class as the Lord. Not only that, it separates us from Him. I don't care, like I'm saying it right here, I don't care how good you are, unless you have the Lord Jesus Christ in your heart, you are separated from Him. Titus 3, 5, Not by works of righteousness, meaning goodness, doesn't matter how good you are, which we have done, but according to His mercy, according to God's mercy, He saved us by His mercy. By the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. It says our goodness that we do doesn't get us to heaven. Our goodness does not get us to heaven. I hope you're hearing what the Word of God is saying. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people are... A, a lot of people think they're going to heaven because they're good. They think maybe, okay, well my good outweighs my bad. I should go to heaven. That's not what the scriptures say. God says, your goodness means absolutely nothing to me. That's what he's saying. It's by his mercy, which means we don't deserve salvation. We don't deserve it, but he offers it to us. But because of his love and his grace, he gives us this mercy. If we accept it. If we accept it. That's the biggie. If we accept that, that mercy, that grace and, his, and love that he gives us. If we accept it. And we do, when we do accept His mercy, He washes us. Which means He cleanses us. He cleanses us from our filthy ways. Our ways are filthy. I done read that. 
Our ways is filthy until God cleans us. Which it says in Ephesians 5.26, The washing of water by the word. How does He cleanse us? By the word. The Bible is what cleanses us. We need to read the Bible. We need to know what the Bible says so we can, so we can be cleaned. So He can wash us. And when that happens, the Holy Spirit comes in us and starts to work through us by the reading of His words. Like it says in 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if any man if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So when you give that with your heart to the Lord, it says you're a new creature. The old things you used to do, even if they were good, it's still old things. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. You become born again. Everything's new again to you. You got a new way of walking, new way of talking, new way of acting. You become a new... That's why it's called born again, because you become new like a baby. And you learn all over again how to live life. Amen? We have people out there who say they're believers, but they show no repentance. They say they believe, but you see no repentance. They keep doing the same thing over and over. This, this verse shows that unless you repent of your sins, you can't be a believer. Unless there's action, which is repentance, showing that you're a believer. Unless, unless there's action, you can't just say, I'm a believer, and expect to make it to heaven. If you say you're a believer, that means there's going to be actions behind it. It means you're going to, you start walking a new life. You don't keep doing the same things you used to do. We need to ask ourselves... Do I believe all the words of God? Now make sure you think before you answer yourself. Listen to me. This is the question. Do you believe all the words of Christ? That's a question for yourself. These religious leaders were rejecting the truth of God by rejecting the words of John. When we witness to people and they don't accept the Lord, they're not rejecting us. They're rejecting the Lord. They might think, oh, it's easy for me to say, uh, you know, not now. But even saying not now, that's still rejecting them. Unless they fall through to their knees and accept them, no matter how, what they say without that, no matter what they say, they're rejecting Him. So they're not rejecting us when we witness to them. They're rejecting God Himself. Mm -hmm. 2 Corinthians 5.20 it says, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. What's ambassadors mean? We represent the Lord. And it says, As though God did beseech you by us. It's saying, It's just like if God is begging you through us, we pray you in God's stead, be reconciled to Him, to God. So we're His representatives. We're His ambassadors. We're just giving the people what God has told us to say. So again, if they reject us, they're not rejecting us. They're rejecting the words of God. That's what they're doing. And pretty much what we've seen so far, these religious leaders are nothing but hypocrites, vipers. They're snakes. They're wolves. Wolves is a man who proclaims to be a Christian, but his heart is far away from the Lord. That's what a wolf is.